My name is Joe Lim, uh, Senior Partnerships and Innovation Officer at the World Federation of UN Associations. So after running uh, a UN-led startup challenge called Citypreneurs for about four years, I'm proud to say that we've signed a partnership with Techstars, the global accelerator, to start um, and expand the effort to sharpen uh, entrepreneurial skill sets uh, in order to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Uh, this conference has been hugely insightful in providing reasons why we need to build businesses that create impact. Uh, today, we'll be discussing the exact area where the rubber meets the road. I must say, and, and I, I definitely believe that engineers um, are able to provide incredible breakthroughs for the sustainable development goals. Um, but I won't be the first to say that not all good engineers make good entrepreneurs. Um, we've prepared this session with the goal of equipping engineers to take the plunge with the highest rate of success possible by de-risking your product development process through a validation framework. So this morning, I'm more than happy to introduce Cody Sims, Senior Vice President and the Sustainability Guru at Techstars to take us through the meat of today's workshop. Cody, uh, the screen is all yours. Great. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, excited to be here. And uh, I want to also welcome uh, one of our uh, portfolio CEOs, Meggie Williams from Skip Town. Meggie, you want to say hi real quickly? Hi. Great. It's nice to be here. <laughs> awesome. So Meggie is... Um, uh, Meggie has, has been a, a, a practitioner of the workshop that we're going to run through multiple, multiple times. And so uh, we thought it would be helpful uh, for you all to hear context from her as well as someone who's actually implemented this in her team. Um, and so really excited to be here today. Uh, just, I guess, maybe a brief introduction for those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, Techstars, we're the worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed. Um, we're one of the most active early stage venture investors in the world through um, uh, our startup accelerator footprint. We run about 50 individual startup accelerator programs around the world each year. Um, each, each one of those programs invests, in invests $120,000 um, in 10 companies per year. So that's about 500 or so odd investments we're making each year around the world. Um, and these are three month intensive sort of boot camp like programs to really help your company um, figure out, you know, are you pointed in the right direction and step on the gas pedal to keep going and then have a big support network of mentors and, uh, and others around your business for the life of your business as you continue to grow. So you can always check us out at techstars.com and we'd certainly uh, welcome uh, any of your companies to apply just like uh, Maggie did a few years ago. Um, and so what we're going to do today is, is I'm going to we're going to show you a workshop that we do very regularly across our accelerator programs that are all about de-risking uh, your business um, and figuring out the assumptions and hypotheses that you maybe still need to validate and, and kind of that the, avoiding building your business on a house of cards, right? Avoiding your build biz, building your business on a number of um, uh, things that you haven't yet proven uh, that could ultimately result in you spending a bunch of cycles on waste for things that don't work. Um, and so uh, I'm going to drive through this, but this is going to be a really interactive conversation between Maggie and me. Maggie, you want to say, say a little bit about Skip Town just before we jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Cody. So I'm Maggie Williams. I'm the founder and CEO of Skip Town. We make it easy for dogs and their parents to live their best lives. And we do that through a tech-enabled ecosystem and a modern country club for pups and their people. Awesome. And you, yeah, people can check that out. What do you want to share the URL real quick? You can just say it. It's, it's oh, skiptown.io, skip yeah. right? It's skiptown.io. Awesome. Thanks. Well, good. Well, here, let me share my screen and uh, I'll, we'll go through this, uh, this presentation here. And I also should say, Joe, we totally appreciate you logging in to introduce us at a very, very early hour, your time in Korea, or I should say not even early hour, like middle of the night hour. Um, so it goes to show that the world is global, uh, very much so, and that we are all, uh, you know, we're all innovating, but uh, it can be hard to do at certain times of the day sometimes. Uh, <laughs> a global world sometimes, uh, you know, requires us all to work odd hours. So we really appreciate you joining us um, at your time. Cool. Okay, so um, 
As mentioned, this is a workshop called Assumptions, Hypotheses, and Roadmaps. We've had thousands of founders go through this workshop over the over the years, um, and it's it's become one of our uh, our core uh, pieces of content and core pieces of curriculum as you're going through TechStars. Um, and so, really, the goals here are to understand the key assumptions in your business, to rank order the assumptions that are critical to test, and to rethink how road mapping is done. Um, and and so. Uh, I, I guess Maggie, maybe you want to just before we even dive into what this, how this works, maybe you want to um, talk a little bit about how you all have used it at a very high level um, and what, what, how it's been useful to your leadership team. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've run through this workshop twice with Cody as a participant, as a as a um, as a CEO, and I've run through it with my leadership team probably half a dozen times. We do it every quarter. The first time that I did this workshop, we were a dog walking company. We had about 100 employees and we operated across three markets, three different cities. The last time, one of the last times we did this workshop, we had shut down our dog walking service in two of those markets. And we had just launched a 24,000 square foot dog bar, park and pet care facility, same company, same team. But we made this pivot because we learned something very important. And what we learned was how and why we needed to reassess the core assumptions on which we were operating. And we did that through this exercise. That's what this workshop does. And I'm excited to be here to, to talk through it because it has been so invaluable to our business and to get us to where, from where we were to where we are today. We would not exist as a company if we had continued down the path we were on. And it was because of a lot of the things that we were blinded by that, you know, by doing this workshop, allows you to just kind of pick your head up and see a, new, the real, a, real, a realer reality than maybe what you operate under right now. That's great. And, and I think that the last thing before we dive in that I'll add is, um, you know, there are, there are oceans and oceans of content out there on uh, product, um, uh, product process, right? Are you going to use Scrum? Or are you going to use Agile? Like, how are you going to do all that? This is not that at all, right? This is not a process workshop. This is a prioritization workshop, which is very different. And it's really much more about kind of quickly building a, a sorting mechanism to help you understand what things you know and what things you don't know. Um, so let's uh, let's dive in. And um, I did get a comment that someone commented on my Jordan ones in the background. I, I just want to say these were my whoops, these were my dads. These were like from 1985, so uh, I, I hold them very preciously. Um, so thanks for whoever noticed that. <laughs> um, all right, so diving in. Um, you know, a couple things, if you're going to do this, one thing to consider is, are you together or are you remote? Obviously, in this time of COVID-19, many, many of us are remote. This workshop is written as though you are doing it together in a room with sticky notes, um, where you're actually writing things down and then putting them on a whiteboard. But if you're remote, there are a couple of virtual whiteboarding tools that I highly recommend. Um, one is called Miro.com and one is called Mural.co. They're similar in function, um, but both allow teams to collaborate remotely with sticky notes on a virtual whiteboard. Um, so if you are remote and want to try to do this afterward, um, check out one of those platforms. They're both um, they both have free plans, so you can you can use them um, in a lightweight way just for this type of exercise. Um, also, this is not an exercise to do by yourself. This really is important for you to gather input from different team members, and I think you'll see why as we go. But maybe maybe you want to represent a little bit about you know why it matters to get the input from your team as you do this, um, as opposed to you know you just doing it as the CEO yourself. So I think what makes this work, this workshop work is doing it collaboratively with your team, because I think what you find is, is that everybody's reality is different. And a lot of times your role determines your perspective. Um, and if you work in a team, you, you, you probably know that already. Um, and when you bring everybody together who has very strongly held beliefs, hopefully passionate, strong beliefs, but that can be persuaded once you have new information. And that's what this workshop does is it gives everybody a chance to really see new information, come together on it, really talk through it, um, to really understand what's the most important, the most critical thing about your business to your business, why your business exists or whatever you're doing, your project exists, like what your, what your common aim is. Um, and you don't get that if you do it siloed. Um, and I think that, yeah, so I, I think doing it with a team um, or with the people that you work with is absolutely critical to getting the value out of, out of this prioritization workshop. Great. So diving in, we, we jump in with this workshop with very little direction. Um, founders who've never done this before, 
come and they get this first slide, which is me just saying, start working. Um, and the first request is write down um, on as an individual exercise, not as a team, on a per sticky note basis, things that you believe drive your business, right? And that's a very broad statement and it's intentionally vague. Um, you know, I, I encourage uh, founders to, and, and companies to think about things like their product plans, their tech plans, their hiring plans, their go-to-market strategies, and really take about 10 minutes and just rapidly write down as many of these types of belief statements as they can. Um, that, you know, so this is, this is a, a volume play, not an accuracy play, because you're wanting to just get as many thoughts down on paper as possible. And so got a couple examples here, not from one company, but just a bunch of random hypothetical belief statements. Uh, things like, I believe the primary channel for customer acquisition will be through organic content marketing. Or I believe, you know, the fear of climate change is influencing where people decide to purchase their first home. Um, or I believe we should launch our product via university campuses starting in the Midwestern US, right? So these are things that either you've already been trying to work on or on your roadmap to go figure out. Um, and, and, you know, your, your goal here is to jam. If you can get, you know, if you can write like one of these every 30 seconds over 10, over 10 minutes, you've got 20. And then if you've got four other teammates doing this, you end up with 80 belief statements that are your, your canvas for starting this workshop. Um, and, you know, I mean, Maggie, I'd love to, I guess maybe flipping to the next slide. Like one thing I always ask founders after they do this is how was it? Was it harder to get started? Was it harder to stop? Did you end up going down a single path? Like I'm gonna write a bunch of belief statements about customer acquisition, um, or do you kind of go broadly across the business? And just, I guess, you know, any feedback you've had as you've run this with new members of your team who haven't done this before, like this first step can kind of feel confusing at first for people, but the feedback I give founders is that's like starting a business. Like you don't have, no one's giving you the directions. You've got to kind of hear a little bit about what you think you do and then, and then you know, figure it out as you go. Um, and that's that's the goal here as well is that you'll refine this as you go. But curious to hear you know your thoughts about how um, team members have have you know kind of gone through this first step. Yeah, I mean, I think it, the first time we did it, it was absolutely uncomfortable because there's so many questions that you want answers to about how to you know move forward, and you 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 want to kind of create the rules before you play the game. And in this scenario, you really just gotta you just gotta put stuff out there. To Cody's point, you know, it's it's quantity over quality. Um, that's kind of the premise of just brainstorming in general, right? Is you, you, you want the, the good ideas will come once you, you know, are putting everything you've got out there. Um, and it is, it does feel uncomfortable because you don't know if you're too granular, if you're too broad, if you're, if you're too specific in a certain area, but, um, and I think you just need to work through that and come and, and really write down whatever comes to mind, because usually whatever's coming to mind is really how you're operating is really what you're believing. If you can, you know, if you can let yourself stop from overthinking, you'll get to the, the, the truths that you operate on, on a daily basis. And that's, I think, and that's really what you want. Um, and, and, you know, come later stages, when you come back to come together with this on the team, it gets easier because it becomes more collaborative. But at this stage, you know, just embrace the, the discomfort that will likely, you know, happen when you're trying to come up with these ideas and you're not sure exactly where to start or, or how to finish it. Yeah, for sure. And I would say too, um, if you're doing it in a virtual setting, like if you're using Miro.com, um, you're all on the same screen together and you're kind of seeing each other, right? But again, I, I encourage you in this very first step to do it individually. So, you know, each of you pick a little corner and put your sticky notes in the corner, but don't talk through them. Because the goal is the more you talk through them at this first stage, the more you're likely to kill brainstorm ideas, right? Because you try to develop consensus and that's not what you want to do here. You want to get every idea on paper that people have. Um, you know, it, it could be a pet project. It could be something that other people think is crazy, whatever, get it on paper because it's going to get sorted through this exercise. Um, so step one, take 10 minutes, write as many stickies as you can about things that drive your business. Then you actually go through and you look at each of the stickies as a team. And this can take a while. If you have 80 stickies, like, you know, that could, I mean, I, I, give, I give you 15 minutes here in my workshop, but sometimes teams are nowhere near done, but after 15 minutes, um, you want to go through, look at all the stickies, talk through them together. Um, if there are some that just feel duplicative, you can kind of pool them together or pick one that's representative of the bunch. Um, and then the important step here is if you have data to back up a belief, and this is an engineering panel, so hopefully everyone appreciates the value of data, um, I want you to draw a big star on the sticky, right? So, um, and the guidelines for this are, are really two things. 
One, do you have some kind of internal dashboard that shows this data somehow? It doesn't have to be 100% accurate, but you know whether it's your Google Analytics dashboard, whether it's your sales pipeline, whether it's your customer CRM, whether it's your customer service logs, whatever that may be, if you have some kind of intuitive data in your company that, that says this thing in the sticky is true, draw a star. Um, or if you've talked to enough customers where you genuinely know this feedback to be true, at least according to that segment of customers you've talked to, um, draw a star on that. You might want to, you know, make that star, make that sticky a little more um, specific to based on these customer types or whatever it is you've talked to. But um, if you have a dashboard or if you've talked to enough customers, draw a star. And then the rubric that I ask founders to go through is, um, would you wager me $100 that I'd agree that this should have a star on it? Right, and so that's a that's a, um, meant to represent a, a very specific request, which is um, this is not like overthink it so much that you're betting the whole company on this. It's like you know, a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars is a big bet, but it's not you know you're not betting your company's life on it, and but it's also not so casual that you're just going to star everything. Like it needs to be like, yeah, I'd bet a hundred bucks that this that someone would say, yeah, I agree that there's data here. Um, Maggie, any anything you guys have come across when you're kind of trying to do this initial data step that that founders struggle with, or that you know is 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 where the kind of identifying where the challenges may come up here for people? Yeah, I I mean I think this is one of the most important parts of setting up this exercise correctly to be able to get the value you want out of it. And it is so easy, and there's a tendency to want to believe um, that what you know is true. And for us, to Cody's point, would you wager $100? It's it's making it's being really tough on yourself. The goal here is not to feel good about all the things that you're saying you know for sure. The goal is to really understand what you possibly don't know um, or don't know to the fullest extent. And so the way our team does it is when we'd be sitting around kind of going through them after we've gotten rid of the duplicates, we'd look at the sticky notes. And if we'd say, okay, have we validated this market size, for instance, we'd be like, okay, like, wow, well, we've got research. If, if there was even a pause, if anybody did the, like the sound, eh, we would put it into unvalidated. So really, really be conservative about when you're, when you're going through this, what you're starring, um, because a lot of times you want something to be true, but back to Cody's point, if you, if you, if your life depended on proving that you had the data, would you be so sure? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think, um, yeah, it's it's it, you know a big thing we preach at TechStars is intellectual honesty, and I think this is this is what Maggie just said is that right, which is don't lean into what you hope to be true, lean into what you actually know to be true for this specific exercise, and, and be be hard on yourselves about those questions. So that's that's sort of step two. You 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 create all these sticky notes, you go through them all, talk through them. If you have data to back up a belief, you draw a star on them. Um, and then you go, and then, you know, I, what I like to do is also debrief with the founders, like after you did this, um, did you notice differences in how each of you approached even the first exercise? Like I often find it interesting that like a CEO maybe really focused broadly across the business. And then, you know, a, a product had a product maybe focused really tangibly on customer feedback on the business. And, uh, you know, your head of sales may be really focused on, you know, sort of pricing and your head of marketing oftentimes may be really focused on, um, you know, on customer acquisition and like, but that's great. Like that's where you get the diversity of sticky notes. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, any, any experiences you've had with that, um, Maggie? So you do get that diversity in, in how, not just what people come up with on the sticky notes, but how people think through this question. And I would just say that after we, now that we've done this a couple of times, many times, it pay attention to that. There is a lot of value in understanding how other people in your company, on your team, on a project think, um, and seeing what they go to and what you go and what you gravitate to is also a, a point of discussion that um, can like lead to, you know, just, just a good side conversation. And, and I think that there's a lot of value to that as well. Um, and I think to Cody's point, at, at least the way we operate is that there's no right or wrong answer with how you approach that, but it is informative to know the, the, the mind frame, the framework that people put around these kind of questions, because it really does define the reality that people hold um, when they're approaching this project. And it's, and it's good for people to understand kind of, you know, what other, people's framework is and this and this helps tell that totally and i would say the, the last thing and you kind of hinted at this a minute ago was there's no right or wrong answer on how many stickies you have with stars you could have um 
you could have, um, you know, one sticky with star, or you could have 40 stickies with stars. And, you know, it's really, it's where are you in this phase of product development as a business, right? So um, if, you know, and I've seen incredibly mature companies, but they're on a new product. And so they're back to having almost no stickies with stars, almost no data. And I've seen companies that are still in the early stage cycle, but they have one product and it's very simple and they've learned a lot about it. And, you know, they're able to star quite a few things. Um, so again, you know, your ebb and flow in your company's lifetime. And you, you mentioned this too, Maggie, like you guys went through this pivot where you knew a lot about the dog walking business and then you decided to move to the physical location space and didn't know anything about that. And so even though your walking business was quite mature, you know, as you were doing this, I'm, I'm guessing when you moved into the physical events business uh, or the, phys the, the physical space business um, for Skip Town, you were starting from scratch. Yeah, no, correct. Um, and we, you know, we, we knew a lot about the dog walking business, but we knew more than we were acting on. And, you know, it goes back to what I think this whole workshop uncovers, which is confirmation bias, is that you can live your life on in any, in any capacity, kind of living off assumptions that you, that you are, you know, you don't necessarily have data to back. And that's what this is starting. This is what's starting to uncover at this point in it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons we moved away from the dog walking business, we had a lot of information, but there was some critical pieces of information that we weren't seeing. And that would have led us down a pretty critically fatal path if we had continued. Um, and by kind of realizing that calling those things out gave us the courage to make different decisions. And if anything, I think this, what you get out of this workshop is courage. Um, because some of the things that you learn can be scary if you when you dig deep. Um, things that you thought were true that may not be. Awesome. Um, okay, great. And then, um, so then the next uh, exercise you do, so you've got all these stickies. Um, what I ask you to do is move only to the stickies with stars. So you're going to only look at the subset of stickies that you, in the previous, previous step, decided to validate. The ones you put stars on said, yes, we have data for that. I want you to look only at those. And these are your validated assumptions. These are things you believe to be true about your business that drive your business and you have data that actually supports that this, the statement you wrote is true. Um, what I want you to do is when you're looking just at that subset, um, I want you to, um, just the subset of validated assumptions. Now I want you to decide which ones of these do you think are most critical to your business? So this is different than do we have data? Is this true? This is, are these things actually really critical to the business. So this is you now trying to get consensus among your team of all the drivers, which ones of those drivers are the most important, specifically of the set where you already know that they actually are true. Um, so of your stickies with stars, which ones are most critical to your business? And then I want you to draw a circle on those. And so the way I want you to do this is to really think in extremes. I want you to not think about, you know, how critical is it right now? I want you to think about how critical is this as the business hits scale? Like if this thing really is true to the utmost extreme, is this going to drive our business to the moon? Um, or is if this thing, like for whatever reason, stops working or isn't true or we mess it up, is it going to drive our business straight into the ground? So think in those massive extremes um, at scale. Um, and then when the answer to, to that is yes for either of those questions, draw a circle. So you'll end up with a handful of stickies that have both a circle and a star. Um, Maggie, any, anything you want to add to kind of the the the, the step of, of this this sort of criticality phase and, and figuring out which ones are your, your top uh, assumptions of importance? Only that if you're working on this with other people who are represent different departments, this does become um, you know you you have to really align to what is the most important, and you know people who feel you know. When you're invested in what you do, you feel ownership over that. And you want what you do to be the most important, to be the top assumption. And depending on how granular you go with the sticky notes, that those questions come up. Um, and people have to be willing to agree on what is a top validated assumption or a top assumption. And it might not be what they're particularly working on. And I think that creates very productive and can create very productive, constructive dialogue. Um, but for us, that that's always, you know, a really fun and challenging part of this exercise is um, to align on what the top assumptions are. Um, because 
you know, if, if you if you run the tech department, the most important thing may be that, you know, that the technology is functional and um, that people will be using technology and that will be, you know, how we go into the future. And if you're running operations, it could be a totally different top um, about it assumption. So I would I would just say, think about that when you're going into it and, and, and make it a learning across, you know, the whole group. Awesome. Um, okay, cool. So we do that and then, you know, basically, um, I, you know, I usually ask founders to th think, you know, what was this easy or hard? Were you aligned or are there things where you, you know, didn't agree? And Maggie sort of talked about that a little bit, you know, sort of the empathy of understanding and appreciating the, you know, the, the, the perspectives of different teams and, and giving them the floor to make sure they're able to fully articulate what's going on in their department or from their experience with this thing. Um, and then, you know, I just ask how many, how many did you select for circles? And again, the answers are always all over the map. Some companies will only have a handful, some will have a lot, and there's no right or wrong answer. This is about you getting the data for your business. Um, and so from, uh, from there, we kind of do the same step. So you look at all of your stickies um, without stars. So these are all the things originally that you said you didn't have data for, right? These are your unvalidated assumptions. These are the things that you believe to be drivers about your business. You believe we're going to move the needle about your business, but you actually don't have the data. So this is truly an assumption or a hypothesis at this point. And so I want you to do the exact same exercise you did before, um, but I want you to do it for the ones that, um, again, you don't have the data for, go through and decide which of those are critical. And this is really tricky because you don't have the data. So you are making a gut call here, um, which is the one time in this exercise I ask you to make a true gut call um, of all of your unvalidated assumptions, which ones are most likely to, again, take your business to the moon or drive you to the ground based on what you all collectively feel. Um, and so this, again, this is more, this is a feeling one. And I'd love, you know, I, I find that the companies um, somehow magically tend to figure this out. Like it's, it's kind of obvious once you're, once you have all these stickies, which ones really feel important, but, um, but uh, you know, and any insights on, on how you have navigated this part of it, uh, Maggie would be awesome. No, I think that, you know, if you run companies, you operate on gut a lot. <laughs> so I think this ends up being a little bit of a more natural um, part of the exercise is to, to be able to um, make quick calls. Um, and, you know, depending on your team and it totally depends on your team. Um, but I would agree that this, you know, comes the fastest probably in my experience for, for the people that I've done this with. Great. Oh, that's awesome. And do you, do you, um, do you end up, do you, do you, ever get ones where you're stuck where you're like you can't get alignments or or whatnot and like and if so you know this is maybe a cultural thing for your company how do you ultimately make the call we um we operate with a lot of uh we try to make it a culture of constructive disagreement so people are used to dissension in the in the sense that you know you can have a different perspective and not agree. But ultimately we try to come to an, an, an agreement. We try to come to an understanding um, to make a call and, and people know that's the end point. So I would be interested, Cody, how you would recommend people move forward when they feel like they're at a stalemate. Um, for us, we always drive toward getting kind of an answer um, on yeah. where, you know, what pilot goes to, but I could also understand where people would just get so locked into being like, nope, I, truly believe it goes here and someone disagrees, what, what would you say to do in that scenario? Yeah, what I've seen work is actually to collectively rewrite the sticky. And sometimes it's to break it into two. Um, so sometimes it's to take a sticky and, you know, reframe it. And, you know, maybe there was one part of the, the language that someone was held up on, or, you know, it was, it was too vague or, you know, some of them sometimes, again, different people in the company are doing this at different stages. And with step one, no one had done this before. So everyone's kind of learning as they go. Sometimes the stickies just need to be tweaked or rewritten. And then you can usually do that and get to a point where you believe. And that's the other thing I would add, as you're going through this exercise, you'll also often, and maybe I'm, I'm sure this happens to you all, you know, you'll often also uncover new things that in, in discussion that you're like, oh man, we should write that down. And that's totally cool. Like write it down, put it, put it, put it on the board and, and add it to your list. Um, and then start or circle it or both as, as appropriate. Um, but I find that the, the discussion sometimes brings up new insights like that that are actually really helpful. Um, and it's totally cool to reframe the, the sticky notes as you go um, if you all decide that, you know, a, a rewording makes the most sense for your business. Um, so then, you know, same thing, you know, just really encourage you to debrief for a minute after you do this. 
you know, were you aligned? Were there ones you didn't, you know, didn't agree? How many did you have for circles, et cetera? Um, so that's sort of the workshop itself. Um, it, you know, at the end, you end up with these four, and I know that was confusing, circles, stars, blah, blah, blah. But at the end, you end up with these four piles of stickies, and hopefully this brings it together, right? You end up, you end up on, the, on the left up left quadrant with your high priority unvalidated assumptions, um, the top right quadrant with your high priority validated assumptions. These have the circle and the star. Um, your bottom left is your low priority unvalidated that are essentially still blank. And your bottom right are your low priority validated that have um, a star but no circle. And so you can then move your stickies into these little buckets. One thing I do see a lot of companies tend to do as well is they'll actually, um, and this isn't part of my instructions, but I, I love it when people go this path. Once they're at this phase, they'll then start to try to bucket the stickies by theme. So like these are our marketing assumptions or these are our product assumptions or these are our customer acquisition assumptions or whatnot too. It's just, you know, it's a little bit even more kind of further refinement of the model. Um, but, you know, you end up with this list of stuff and then from there, you can actually use this to help you make decisions as a business. And so I'm going to give you my thesis on how you can do this. And then let's hear from Maggie on how you how companies actually do this. Um, so, you know, the thesis I have is that the high priority unvalidated, the high priority validated assumptions, the things that are a circle with a star, these are things that are ready for you to actually spend product cycles on. The, you believe these are important to your business, that you have data that says they're important, and you've decided that of those, these are some of the most critical things you can do. You should be cranking on this stuff. And of course, you got to, you know, send individual features through feature validation, but these are areas where your company should be focused now. Um, your high priority unvalidated assumptions where you have a circle and no star, to me, these are the most important things that come out of this exercise. Because these are the things that you have deemed to be critically important to your business, but that you don't actually know. And so this is that whole, like you could be building on a house of cards here with this stuff. And so my advice is this is the area where you should spend a ton of time prioritizing for customer discovery, um, for you know feedback interviews, for user research, usability studies, whatever it may be, sales validation, you need to go out and figure this stuff out before you spend a bunch of engineering and product cycles building in this area because it could end up being huge amounts of waste. Um, and then this is obviously overly simplistic, but the bottom areas, the both buckets of low priority, my advice is just ignore as much of that as you can so you can focus on the top things. So I'm curious how you all actually deal with this in practice, because I know this is like the theoretical layout of this, but you know, anytime you're building a company, everything's more complicated than the, the theoretical view. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when we did this workshop the first time, we found out that a lot of the assumptions that we had that were critical to the business, to our dog walking business, we just didn't have data around them. A lot of them centered around market size and the ability to generate new clients at the right you know, acquisition costs to really support scaling the operations we had built. But only it was a product market fit problem. And you know, we were operating on data that was anecdotal, data that was anecdotal, but was supporting these critical assumptions that was kind of all moving us toward a certain path. And you know, at that point, when we when we sketched that out and we saw the unvalidated high priority assumptions, we knew we had some homework to do. So we went back and we created a plan to go get that data and to go really like put a new lens on how we were seeing. What, what we knew and believe was core to the success of this certain business that we were running. And we, you know, we came back and we came back to the table after doing that. And we realized that we had, we, you know, we were, we were very excited because we felt like we now had the foundation to make different decisions that we knew ultimately were going to fundamentally change the direction of the business. Um, and I, you know, I, I guarantee that if you're part of a team that your team is operating off of different assumptions that you all believe to be true and some you might have data and some important ones you might not and it's you know it's it, it's a gravity creating experience to all at the same time see that together and then think about well wh where do we go from here and for me and for us that's always and, and that's you know that's always the, the most exciting thing is to be able to say okay now we know this what action steps do we take to move it forward? And in our case, we completely pivoted our business. We shut down most of the core product service that we were offering, and we expanded into a whole new direction because of, of the learnings of, of this workshop. Um, awesome. So yeah, and that's why we do it every quarter. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. 
<laughs> yeah, and and I've got I got a couple uh, you know I've got multiple portfolio companies like you who do this on a regular basis um, and use it as a leadership planning exercise. Um, I, you know, I, I also, I personally run a nonprofit called Climate Change Makers, which is a whole um, political action group around climate change. Um, if you're interested in that, check us out at climatechangemakers.org. Um, and we have run through this as well ourselves um, as our own company. So I kind of brought my leadership team through this workshop. And similarly, we came into this sort of thinking like our assumptions were all about community growth and growing the community. And what we what we ultimately ended up realizing based on this exercise was that our prioritization there was a little bit off. Um, and that, you know, really our focus should be on community health and community engagement um, and, you know, how we uh, drive community diversity, community retention, and ultimately um, community, um, community longevity. And so, um, you know, th this exercise really helped us shift our priorities as well. Um, so, you know, I, I can speak from it a little bit as a, um, you know, as, as someone who's gone through it once or twice myself, in addition to who's, who's led the workshop lots of times. Um, and then, um, you know, a lot of the reason for this, I'm gonna go through this last part really quickly, but basically product development has changed so much. Like we've gone from a world where, um, you know, we used to build products in these crazy waterfall ways. Um, when I start, I mean, I've been in, in the industry a long time and I started way back in the late 1990s, we used to write these crazy documents called a product requirements document, which was this like 30 page list of features that you wanted to go build. You would have, you know, engineering sign off and marketing sign off and whatever, and then engineering would build it and then you would ship it. And, you know, that would, it would be this like flow chart process. Um, that's obviously not how product is built today. We all live in a world of agile or lean startup or scrum and we're running backlogs and burning down through. The, the great thing about agile and lean startup and, and you know, kind of modern product development process is it gives you incredible granularity on what you're working on right now, but it's really hard to plan what you should be working on three months from now, six months from now, um, where the vision of the company is going. And so I, I find that this workshop um, can, can help you set a framework for where you should be focused. But this is where I sort of think roadmaps as they exist today are somewhat broken. You know, I think a roadmap as a sacred blueprint about what you're gonna be doing a year from now is ridiculous. Like no company knows what they're gonna be doing a year from now. Um, and so what I see is a lot of founders change, but you have to have a roadmap. You need one to go raise money. You need one to, for your team members to know what you're working on, what the priorities are. You need one for your board members if you have one to know what you're working on. Um, and so I see a lot of founders try to pivot the roadmap into an aspirational plan. This is what we're going to try to do. Um, but even then, like you're saying that oftentimes very much unrooted in data or reality of like knowing what you're aiming toward down the road. Um, and so my a big um, uh, sort of uh, thing I like to advocate for is something I call a learning roadmap, which is rather than making it very super feature oriented, like here's what we're building nine months from now, which is a, basically a ridiculous thing to try to claim as a startup. Um, it's much more about what are we going to learn over the next little while. Um, I've often um, heard people say, and I tend to agree with this, that you really only know what you're actually working on for about two months out, two to three months out. And anything beyond that is kind of, let's see where the world goes. And so trying to create a roadmap that shows what you're building a year from now is a false premise. But showing the roadmap that says, by two quarters from now, we want to have learned this about our business, or by three quarters from now, we want to have learned that about our business, and then we can prioritize accordingly, um, gives you a, a view on, on, on how to show where the future is headed without committing to like little granular features that are going to set your team or your, or your investors or others um, false expectations of what you're actually going to be delivering. I don't know if, if, I mean, let me know, does that resonate with you too, Maggie? Like, do, do you all do anything like that at all? Or is that just me in sort of ivory tower land? No, we do. And I think, and what we add on to that is how, what do we need to fail at to, to get those learnings? And I think this one, something that was also really powerful from, from this exercise is, is really leaning into failure as a, as a positive thing. How do you go out and test and learn and use that as feedback that drives, you know, future decisions. And, and when you think about like, what, what do I want to learn? It's also like, what am I, what do I need to fail at to learn it? And so when we think about it in that way, failure becomes so much less of an, it because doesn't become negative anymore. It becomes like, what do we need to do to break this to, to realize something else? Um, hmm. That's what I would I'd add back. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think oftentimes it's just the difference of saying, you know, it's a semantics thing of saying, you know, we're going to focus on what we're shipping as opposed to we're going to focus on what we're learning. Um, right. And, you know, the, the last thing I'll leave you, you, you all with on, on this regard is, 
I don't think hope is a strategy. Um, and I think if you don't have data, you only have hope. Um, and so I, I also don't think you want to be in analysis paralysis where you don't actually do anything, you just collect data. You've got to find that middle ground, but you want to make informed decisions so you're not jumping off a ledge every time you try to do something. Because um, goodness knows if you jump off a ledge, like hopefully you're a good base jumper, but you know, sometimes uh, the, the shoot may have problems. Um, so we want to make sure that when you're jumping, you're actually ready to catch an updrift. Um, and, and you know, that's that's sort of our, our workshop for today. And we'd love to spend a few minutes here if folks have questions. Um, they could be questions about the exercise. They can be questions about Maggie's business, Skip Town. They can be questions about Techstars. Um, we did get one question at the very beginning. Someone asked me if Techstars is live in Egypt. Um, we don't have an accelerator program in Egypt, though we have a very active Startup Weekend community in Egypt. So, you know, if you want to go, um, you can you can check out Startup Weekend, which is an organization of Techstars. Um, it's it helps you at the you know sort of very beginnings of your business um, spend. Um, uh, spend about uh, 72 hours sort of figuring out is what does it even mean to build a startup? But we do have quite a few other um, accelerators in the region. Um, we have a program in Abu Dhabi. Um, we have a program in um, uh, Tel Aviv. Um, and I'm trying to, uh, I think those are our two in, in the region there, um, but with, with potentially more on the way. Um, so let's see, we have another question. Um, Joe asks, uh, what are some mistakes entrepreneurs make most often when validating their data? You want to take this, Maggie? Yeah. So something that's I think important about all this is what we talked about it a little bit, but what is that? What is validated data, right? And that's a whole conversation in of itself. Is how do you source data that you can rely on? And I would say that is one of the biggest, right? And I we go after you know the industry leading reports you know, that have been credit, you know, they're credible, that are validated. Um, IBIS, uh, you know, industry leading reports specifically in our field that have, you know, that's have some validation because it's very easy to just go into Google and start typing and find articles and use that. And, and you just have no idea the, the, you know, the agenda behind some of that or, or who's financing it. And it can really change the message. And then the other, so, and Cody, I would also, you know, think you should jump in here and talk about validated data sources as well. Um, and the other thing I would say is how you perceive data. So you could have really credible data, but you just read it wrong or differently. Um, and so I think, you know, how you are, depending on how that great, that data is being presented and how you are then perceiving and internalize it is also, can also fit your story. It can fit a confirmation bias if you want it to. And so I think those are two really important things. And I think if you have a team around you, that goes back to why this is so important not to do by yourself. And yeah. it's so important to create that, that culture of of, of questioning and asking and reassessing because you know we've done that exercise and we've had people be like I don't think that's I don't think that data says that I don't and then we have a discussion around it so I do think having more people in the room more perspectives in the room to kind of call that out will help true um, true your 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 baseline for for you know accurate data and how you're perceiving it yeah and I think you know one of the I totally agree with that one of the things that I um, you know, I really emphasize first party data, right? I really emphasize using your the data you've been able to gather for validation, right? So whether again, that's data from one of your own dashboards or, you know, data you've been collecting or customer insights that you have that are proprietary to you. Um, I don't, I'm not a big believer in using um, a, a big, uh, you know, heavy amount of like third party reports. I'm definitely not a big believer in using, um, here's what uh, our competitors are doing um, because your competitors maybe, you know, just as as uh, uninformed as you were around what the market wants, and maybe they've taken a leap of faith, and you know you're going to jump off a blind leap of faith with them, which is not what you want to do. Um, so again, I, I really emphasize the first party data sources. Um, let's see, we have another question. Um, oh, we got a TechStars question. So, what services do TechStars provide to startups that go through your program? Do you help with financing? Um, and uh, yes, absolutely. So TechStars, um, actually, let me, Maggie, let me let, let you answer this because uh, you've been through TechStars. So what has TechStars provided for you? So, so TechStars provided a lot. So I went through the program in 2018. Um, and so that was a fully immersive 
you know, we were, we had nine other companies in our cohorts. So we got to know them really well. We went through workshops just like this. I would say offhand another dozen of them that were also led by industry experts with just, just such incredible experience across the board that actually traveled around to deliver these workshops um, and on a whole host of topics, but were really fundamental to, to this. I think the success of any great, any business that has the potential to be great. Um, we did that. And then the most valuable thing for me is as as I continue to be an alum and supporter of the program and involved in many ways has been the network and the people and the give first mentality that Cody I know you can talk to at length but for me was just permeated not just within my time at Techstars but is something that I've def that have taken with me and has been something that I have gotten back 10x um, just it is a very involved and supportive community of high achieving people who want others to to win um, and don't think that someone else's win is their loss. And that mentality is just, is really hard to find. Um, and so it has been a privilege to be a part of a group of people that just so strongly believe that. Um, and then not only that, but Techstars Ventures came into to one of our funding rounds. So we have Techstars as an additional investor um, and just a constant resource. Awesome. Um, and let's see, we probably have time for one more question. We had one that came in. Um, asking about uh, what are good references or resources for validation processes. There was another one about stage gate process, which I, I have to admit, I'm not familiar with. So I'm sorry, I, I don't, unless unless you are, Maggie, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I have not used that methodology, though I'll definitely go read more about it. Um, I do have a question about uh, resources or, or, or references for validation process. I would definitely point you to, there's a software planning tool called Product Plan, um, and they've got a really nice blog about product stuff. Um, and so I'd encourage you to follow their, their blog and they do a lot of discussions around this type of work, um, which is a good resource I rely on. Um, I think that may be it for our questions. I think Joe, you wanted to, you were gonna come back in and uh, we're gonna do a little wrap up with some really exciting news about, um, about uh, sustainability and some of the work we're doing together. And I wanna, uh, Maggie, I wanna thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to help us out and provide your insights. I think it's so much more valuable for the panelists to hear from someone who's been doing this than just to hear me talking at everybody. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hope that helped. Thanks. Awesome. Guys. Anyone with a dog, check out skiptown.io. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. A, a very big applause. And thank you, Cody, for going into the super helpful details of how we can base our company's decisions over things we can validate. Um, I'm sure the engineers listening here today are were like more than happy to be able to tell their CEOs that they need that data to validate their thinking <laughs> and decisions. And uh, um, uh, Maggie, thank you also so much for adding flesh to the conversation and, and grounding us in a to a real context throughout the process. I'm definitely announcing to my team on Monday that we're going to have a 90 minute debriefing session coming up at the end of the week. Um, well. All right, I think I think our time is almost up. So I'd like to extend my gratitude to the to the 40 or so participants who took interest in our talk. Um, you know, as you're uh, moving on to the next program, make sure to check out the Techstars and the Citypreneurs virtual booth. Um, Techstars and Wufuna are, are, are together um, preparing a Techstar sustainability challenge. Um, uh, Mariella has gracefully uh, put a link for us. Um, yeah, on, in, in the chat. At. Um, and uh, we're looking for startups that make um, you know supply chains uh, sustainable. And the uh, final deadline is March thirty first, two thousand twenty one. Uh, application application is open already. Um, and so you know, uh, please check out the link that you can find on in the chat box. Um, and I, I think I think that's pretty much it. And, and uh, you know, uh, Cody. Um, is showing us uh, the details of this challenge. Uh, there's there's two aspects of it. One is data and automation. The, the second is materials and end of life impact. I, I don't think we have the time to go into all the details about the challenge just here. So please um, take your time to uh, to visit us uh, in the link below. Um, and again, many thanks for participating in the Tech Stars and Wufuna Assumptions and Hypothesis De-Risking Workshop. Thank you, Impact Engineers and their staff, uh, Mariella and Lily, who graciously invited us to this event and made this workshop possible. And I hope everyone has a great lunchtime. Thank you again, everyone. Goodbye.